Professor Nancy Green. A uh, very warm welcome. I'm very, very happy uh, to that you are here today with us at the European University mm -hmm. Institute. Thank um, you. I'm <laughs> delighted to be here. <laughs> so you are a professor of history um, at the OHSS, mm -hmm. Ecole des Hautes Études de en Sciences Sociales in Paris, and uh, you have published extensively on comparative history of migration. Um, and your most recent book, uh, entitled The Limits of Transnationalism, is forthcoming in May, so very soon. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to start with a few questions on, on, on this book and later touch upon some aspects of the topic on which um, you will give a talk this afternoon, uh, the economics of mobility. Um, so the first uh, question uh, is, so in, in your forthcoming book, we had the chance to... Um, read one of your chapters um, today for the masterclass. Uh, so in your forthcoming book you speak of a transnational moment marked by a widespread use of the term. Can you say a few words about the protagonists of this moment and how they use this term? And in particular I'm curious to know more about their understanding of the state. Well the term is appeared in the early part of the 1990s. There had been uses of it previously, um, but the term that seems to have take, really took off in the early part of the 1990s uh, came about in different contexts. So there was one use of it in the United for United States history in order to talk about the necessity of internationalizing U.S. history. But in my field in migration studies, it was uh, thanks to anthropologists, Nina Glick-Schiller and others, uh, who used the term to talk about migration and a kind of new forms of transnational migration today. Uh, I talk about it as a moment in because there, I think one can link it to forms of talk about globalization, uh, what Michael Ling has talked has called the language of globalization, which from the 1980s on became part of a way of thinking about the world, uh, particularly linked to increased mobility, exchange, etc. Um, largely through two things: one would be the economics of globalization of the, from the 1980s, neoliberalism, new language about what exchange should be. And then uh, the other aspect of the moment of the transnational in the moment is politics. And basically the, the fall of the um, Berlin Wall, the um, uh, end of the Soviet Union, which also were forms of questioning then the world as we knew it, but in, 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 in really creating a notion of movement and mobility that hadn't existed before. And that, I would say, has lasted through, but nonetheless has taken um, uh, probably uh, the notion that the, almost that the nation state was not going to that there exists anymore, that globalization was now the way of the world. Uh, but in, I would say from 2001 on, we've seen that borders are back, hmm. and they're being talked about today, of course, in ways about the wall in the United States, um, in ways that are really, really disheartening. Um, yeah, it's interesting because, um, so I'm in the law department, so um, in my field, transnationalism also came more or less in the same time as uh, globalization and global governance studies, um, which actually mean different things for uh, different scholars. I mean, I, I, uh, the disciplines with which mm -hmm. you engage, I think they also, uh, scholars use uh, these terms in different uh, ways. So, for instance, in, in, in the legal field, we have people who dream about global legal rules or principles like in administrative law, constitutional law, commercial law, or even citizenship. But we also have a critical trend that looks on how power relations are legally structured on the global scene. And within that critical stream of thought, we have also people who think about the legal foundation of imperialism and its reproduction um, after decolonization. Um, so, 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 um, um, so I guess we have like um, um, like similar, let's say, terminology similar different. terminology, but then with different implications. I, I mean, legal scholars think about the role of law in, in, in this contemporary debate. So, um, uh, it's uh, also interesting to see how. Um, how uh, think how different disciplines think about these issues. Um, so I was wondering, um, 
what can history and comparative history in particular teach us about transnationalism um, and how, what does this say about the way in which transnationalism has been approached in other fields? It was interesting what you said just before about the disciplines using it differently. I would say fields have used it differently, as yeah. I said, for U.S. history or for uh, migration history. Uh, but also there are competing terms so that in a way, and that they're sometimes used interchangeably. So comparative history, transnational history, global history, just for historians. Uh, histoire croisée, uh, there are different circulation, there are different terms that are all being used with different nuances, different scholars want to emphasize one particular term, um, saying why it is distinguished from another, entangled history, etc. Um, I think it, uh, I'm rather sometimes ecumenical about uh, the, the terminology issues because I think the in some ways, the fact that terms are used interchangeably show that there, there's something general out there that's being referred to. On the other hand, the difference between transnational history and comparative history. Mm -hmm. um, one can compare things. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're transnational in a sense that things are circulating. Uh, one could have a definition, as I have, su I have at times suggested, of comparative history, which is not simply... Um, comparing two things, but also looking at the interactions between them and the way in which each of the um, elements sees the other. So I have an expansive use of the term comparative history, others do not, and therefore criticize it maybe and say that it, we should rather be doing cross history or entangled history, etc. So it's, I think it's very complex. I think it, it depends on disciplines, it depends on scholars and how they're using the terms. Um, and it can sometimes depend on national traditions and how in different countries some of the disciplines are using the terms. Um, so it's, it's, I don't have one absolute definition um, mm. of, of these distinctions. I think what's important is that we recognize that this is the way these term, this terminology is being used. I've seen, you know, sentences where someone will say, well, this is, you know, comparative history, transnational history, global history in one breath. And then others who will say, well, no, global history is you know, larger, comparative history is more this, transnational history is more the, so, the, compare, the so, connections. So why have you chosen to, to write about transnationalism in particular? Probably because in my field in migration history, first of all, when it arose, it seemed for historians it was invented or <laughs> discovered or mm -hmm. promoted by anthropologists first. And the historians had the reaction of, well, this is not necessarily new, although the anthropologists were writing as though it were a new phenomenon and, and arguing that it was a new phenomenon. Um, the historians were saying, for migration, migrants have always been transnational. So it is something that I'm responding to and talking about in the context of my own field. Um, and I think that it's been a useful term uh, for rethinking even the history of migration at the same time as saying, wait a minute, it's not necessarily all that new. There are elements of this that existed before. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you, in your work you put forward um, an alternative to the ways in which transnationalism, mm. transnationalism has been approached so far um, as a way to address your own critiques on the overemphasis of agency. Um, right? So can you say a little bit more about this and how it relates to the structure agency debate? Transnationalism has been used, and I think it is salutary to point out the ways in which people have moved back and forth, it, that it has been a way of criticizing the notion that migration is linear from point A to point B, and then people either assimilate, integrate, get in, you know, and settle in in various ways or not. And so in that respect, it has been useful. However, uh, the tendency is often on, and it's kind of, it is exciting to think about, well, there were more connections in the past than we thought about or looked for or found. And I'm always emphasizing the fact that we find what we look for, and if previous types of uh, historiography on immigration looked for assimilation or looked for ethnicity, we found it, and it was very interesting. Now, the next phase historiographically is of transnationalism also has been exciting, finding different connections, finding go-betweens, individuals who have been able to circulate widely using language skills, translators, etc. 
Um, however, there has been, it seems to me, an emphasis in the literature on, thanks to the excitement of these finds, which I find perfectly legitimate, but there has been um, an, an emphasis on these possibilities of movement, of going back and forth, of being able to circulate, to, to also to kind of forget about the state and, and to show how individuals that, or groups and, and people at different times have been able to uh, be mobile. This is true, but I think at the same time we've forgotten that it's not always that easy. <laughs> So, so I mean, I'm basically calling for a call to re-examine the transnational links and connections which are, are exist and which we have re-found or re-emphasized to also think about what have been obstacles, what have been difficulties, um, how it is not always that simple to just pick up and leave. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, so um, I would like to move on to the second part of my question. So um, this afternoon you, you will give a talk on the economics of mobility. Um, so can you tell us a bit more on what you mean? What, what is exactly your approach? Is it a critical approach? And if it is, what is it critical? Or what is it critical of? <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, I've already changed the title. So you changed the title, yeah. okay. <laughs> and to talk about a new look at the economics of migration, mm -hmm. which is really what it's about. The mobility turn, which is part of transnational focus, right. etc., has become also a word of the day: mobility, uh, which I think is quite interesting. But, uh, in fact, I am talking about migration because there are many forms of mobility, and it could be whether from tourists to other forms of. of of exchange and movement. So uh, here I am talking about migration and what I'm basically suggesting is that we've so we have lost interest, we have lost focus on the economics of migration. I think this is also a historiographic moment uh, mm -hmm. because there too there has been emphasis on uh, although there was previous interest, and I'll talk about this at the beginning of the talk, previous interest in understanding how migration fits in the history of capitalism, for example. Um, we haven't, we, this kind of got lost with the linguistic turn, um, I think, and some of the other interests, even in citizenship, which is a very important issue, uh, but the economics of people moving and what that means and uh, for, at different levels, I think, is something that we have lost sight of, and yet I think could maybe be helpful in today's climate to come back to that in order to get away from a discourse which on um, immigrants, which particularly a derogatory discourse, which focuses really mostly on the cultural otherness of immigrants. And if we come back to thinking why people move, how states can benefit from immigration, I think it would be a useful mm -hmm. in today's context. Absolutely. So, um I was wondering how does how does your um, so this this move of you know analysis of economics of migration um, like how how within this move how do you approach the distinction between political and economic migration which is so much ingrained in political and um, and legal thinking today so do you. That, does your approach build on it, or or does it somehow challenge it, or goes or maybe go beyond it? Or maybe beyond. it's a step to the side, or the side. <laughs> <laughs> or backward. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but simply in terms of thinking about um, the economics of migration, I think it, it's there are things in the literature which exist but mm -hmm. which are no longer part of the the debate. Uh, I did. And in the talk, I will talk little about the politics of migration or uh, citizenship issues, even though I know this is the citizenship group which has organized the uh, the talk. I'll mention well, citizenship a bit at the end. I mentioned like the political economic distinction, mm -hmm. mostly in the sense that there are people who flee war and there right. are people who migrate. Right. No, so that the question for economic reasons. So it's, like, okay. this is the dis distinction that I personally have a problem with because it, it's, it's... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I actually, and I don't address it explicitly in, in the talk, but it's yes. maybe almost understood because, yes, there's been a great debate over the last few years particularly between the difference between refugees and migrants. And I, and I think many other scholars, have said 
yes, there are differences, but at the same time, the distinction, first of all, can be used in ways which are not helpful. Um, the example which is always, to me, the clearest was when the difference between Cuban refugees and Haitian uh, refugees in the United States, the Cuban, Cubans were defined as refugees, the Haitians as immigrants, and therefore economic, whereas the Cubans were political refugees and the Haitians economic migrants. And the government said that, okay, political refugees we will accept and economic migrants we don't want. So there is a use of that distinction which, uh, between refugees and migrants, which can be very, um, very can be implemented, and which I think can, is is very questionable. Another reason why I um, question the distinction is that refugees, and with all of the um, trauma that that implies, and which I respect, and refugees who themselves do not necessarily want to be called migrants mm -hmm. and don't want to be confused with e economic mm -hmm. migrants. Uh, nonetheless, eventually will become economic migrants in a sense. Right. So over time, uh, the two groups, even with very different starting points, um, have similar problems of, of, of settling in. So I think in that respect, those who come as refugees more for political reasons, those who come as more economic migrants. We also know that to, to describe someone as an economic migrant, we can also say they are voting with their feet, and it's also a political statement with regard to the regime from which they come. Mm. Um, so there are a lot of problems with those distinctions. Uh, and so when I'm talking about um, the economics of migration, uh, I haven't made an explicit distinction in this paper in any case about um, refugees and, and economic migrants. So I'm talking about the economics of what people have to do in order to migrate, but also even in order to flee. So there's much of it which also refers to um, the kinds of uh, difficulties and costs involved for individuals um, on, on, on route. Right. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so, um, so when I read your abstract, so what I understand from it is that you're mainly interested in how supply and demand of labor historically underpinned migration. Um, so you choose labor markets as your main angle. And I was wondering how imperialism, understood mostly in its economic um, um, dimension, plays out in your understanding of, of labor markets. I could do, would, would, you, mm. would you also address this, this aspect? Or, um, I think that the, um, the geopolitics linked to labor markets, which is probably not a good way of saying it. The, the, geo, there are the geopolitics which are going to influence who, people's, the, the flows that occur, because you have Puerto Ricans in New York and you have Algerians in Paris. Right. So th these are uh, similar colonial situations, although the Puerto Rican situation is sometimes described disc disc differently, but I think there are, some, there are parallels there. So there are geopolitical um, migration flows, but which at the same time are also economic migration flows. So they're informed by the imperial colonial connection, including whatever forms of discrimination or Im Im imaginaries about the populations uh, involved, uh, including notions of hierarchy that exist before people even migrate. Um, so I think it's, it's, an, it, it's, an, um, it's part of the factor. Of it, but uh, in, even in those cases, I think that one cannot study just the imperial, uh, even racial um, aspect of these flows without also understanding the economics that are at work at the same time. So it's not to give greater uh, valence to one or the other, but to say that we need to kind of remember also that these migration f movements have also taken part in specific moments where economically it was more possible to do this or that. Right. Thank you. And one last question, um, um, linked more uh, to the contemporary events. Um, so migration is a, a hot topic today, has been an important aspect of Brexit. It has been also defined for a few years now as a crisis in, in Europe, and this in turn sparked the rise of the far right in several member states. Um, so I was just wondering, um, from your perspective, how can history help us understand these contemporary developments? And another question, if 
I don't know, if you were to speak to, let's say, Victor Orban or Matteo Salvini, <laughs> what would you tell them as, as, as a historian? <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> um, first of all, in uh, talking about migration as a crisis today, I always uh, repeat crisis for whom. It's defined as a crisis for the countries of immigration. Uh, it's a crisis for those people who are fleeing, without question, but that's not really the, where the sentiment seems to be focused. Uh, the concomitant rise of the far right and the use of migration and, and, and immigrants as a focal point for explaining the ills of the, of the world is just unacceptable in my view and I think it's also where maybe history can bring some light to bear. Pointing out that for most of the immigration countries of the past century, century and a half, immigrants have be, been a positive factor, positive economic factor over time. They have also settled in over time. So the notion that they aren't assimilating right away in like two days, well, you know, give, the, <laughs> give them a chance. <laughs> Let them work, for example. <laughs> um, clearly there are, you know, difficulties of accepting people who are different, who come from elsewhere, who have different customs, different practices, religious uh, practices, but also just cultural practices. Um, but that's not necessarily really the problem, in my opinion, but mostly it's the use of that. It's the use of this otherness which is created, I mean, that is being revived in this new, mm. these new forms of xenophobia that are right. being mobilized by the populist right, uh, which, I, which I think are problematic and which are blind to the historical um, uh, examples of the past. Uh, in the U.S., migration historians have also been recently marshalling their efforts to look at past t moments of exclusion. This is not really that new for the United States, although we, I would say both in the United States and particularly abroad, have this view often that the United States was always welcoming a nation of immigrants, but historically there were ups and downs and there were some really very dire down periods. Um, and I think it's important to, rem to remember this as well. At the same time, I would place more emphasis on looking at what worked in the past uh, in order mm -hmm. to try and be more optimistic about what the future holds. I always say that um, exclusion and immigration restriction uh, and the history of immigration itself makes me both pessimistic and optimistic. Pessimistic when one sees repeated cycles of xenophobia and the recurrent use of how the new immigrants, well, even if the old immigrants, you know, settled in, the new ones never will. Well, we've heard this generation after generation, and then the new immigrants ultimately become old immigrants. Right. No, no problem. Uh, immigrants. But um, this uh, recurrence, therefore, is rather depressing, and to see it today in action is, is actually for migration scholar. The last few years have been just really, really yeah. very, very troublesome. At the same time, the positive, which one can see with these recurring historical cycles, is that also people do settle in and they become the old immigrants or they become the old group that no one worries about anymore. And I am convinced that this will happen for the new, new migrants, uh, whether they're refugees or, or workers or however one wants to define them. Um, I just need to have that optimism about the future, and I think it's important to, to think about and to show that in the past this has been the case. So if I had to talk to Orban, that's what I would say. <laughs> I'm not sure I would get uh, uh, maybe a, um, a sympathetic uh, hearing, but this is what I would even you know say to Donald Trump. So yes. it's a tough role these days, but one that's important for social scientists of all disciplines to engage in, um, and it's not easy. Not easy. No. So on this hopeful note, <laughs> try. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm looking forward to, to, to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you.